Hello everybody and welcome back to the Ultimate Fashion History for an episode of Fae Film Fashion. In this episode we're heading into the Forbidden Zone to look at Morton Hark's incredible and imaginative costumes for 1968's Planet of the Apes and we will be tying all of this in with, yes, the Byzantine Empire as we grapple with one of my more outlandish theories. In fact, I should probably title this episode this is what happens when fashion historians have too much time on their hands, but bear with me, this is going to be great. Um, here's my copyright disclaimer saying that yes, I am allowed to use these images because they fall under the heading of scholarship, education and research in this context. And I would really love to dedicate this episode to my old friend, Rory Monteith. I recently learned that Rory had passed and there was nobody on this planet or any others who loved the original Planet of the Apes franchise more than he. So Rory, this one's for you. Now I should make it clear at this point that I'm only going to be discussing 1968's Planet of the Apes and the immediate sequels, Beneath the Planet of the Apes, Escape from the Planet of the Apes, Conquest, all of those movies, the movies costumed by Morton Hark. My Planet of the Apes, as I call it. Why? Because in the early 1970s, the height of ape fever, when there was the cartoon, there was the TV show, I, who was, what, seven, eight, something like that, was utterly obsessed with Planet of the Apes. I had all the merch. My favorites were the Planet of the Apes activity books, and as I was pulling these images from the internet, I actually have this weird folk memory of colouring in these guerrilla soldiers and making this Dr. Zaius mask. These books were great. Word games like this. The word search. Look, I can do it. Taylor. Apes. Zera. Planet. I'm doing this all from memory. Escape. I had every single action figure. Every single one. And I also had the Ape Village and the Planet of the Apes Treehouse gift set. I had it all. Take a look at the cover of that gift set. The box includes laboratory table, secret weapons bench, capture net and carry pole, control sticks. This is like Jeffrey Dahmer's living room. It's very serial killer-ish, isn't it? Laboratory table and capture net. But I loved it all. I am not, however, today, 45 years later, a Planet of the Apes aficionado. If any Planet of the Apes or Pota aficionados are watching this and I make mistakes, forgive me. I'm a fashion historian and I want to talk about the costumes. Now, I always believe that the mark of a truly brilliant and iconic piece of movie wardrobe is when you see the costume without the actor wearing it and know instantly what movie it's from. Like this, or this, or this. Come on, we all know these movies, right? And I say the same can be said for Morton Hark's work on Planet of the Apes. Even if you haven't seen the original Planet of the Apes, it is such a part of our pop culture landscape. We can just see these iconic costumes and know we're in ape territory. That understood, it always surprises me that Morton Hark's work on Planet of the Apes hasn't been analyzed more and discussed more and celebrated more. And I think the reason for that is because of John Chambers' makeup for the movie. It was so revolutionary, these incredible prosthetics that moved and were dynamic and you could recognize the actors, Maurice Evans, Roddy McDowell, Kim Hunter, even though their faces were full of plastic. It really was a remarkable moment in special effects, but I think it sort of stole the thunder a little bit from Morton Hark's work, which I think is utterly incredible. He really did create a very believable landscape and universe via his costumes. In my research, I didn't find an awful lot of information about Morton Hark. 
he didn't work on all that many movies, which is unusual considering he worked on such an iconic one. But we do know his work, of course, from the unsinkable Molly Brown and Please Don't Eat the Daisies with Doris Day, very different movies to Planet of the Apes. And I just realized I'm putting this Please Don't Eat the Daisies poster up. I'm making this video just a day after we lost Doris Day. And yesterday I did make a special tribute video on Doris Day, if you want to check that out, if you haven't already. Anyway, back to Planet of the Apes. Well, if my research is correct, the original costume concept for Planet of the Apes drew very heavily on Native America, Native American indigenous and traditional attire. This was ultimately deemed politically incorrect and quite rightly given the subject matter of the movie and evolved into something like this, which then evolved into something like that. So unique, so extraordinary. This has never been seen before, or has it? This is where my theory comes in. Drum roll, please. Or better still, one of those scary horns you always heard when the guerrilla soldiers came galloping in. I honestly and genuinely believed that Morton Huck looked to the Byzantine Empire for his inspired costumes for Planet of the Apes, and I'm going to try to prove this theory right now. Let's start with some basic kit. Nearly every ape character in Planet of the Apes wore a version of this, a slitted tunic with three-quarter length sleeves. Not that dissimilar to the Byzantine Dalmatica, right? Not convinced? Well, remember, the Dalmatica was usually worn with either a tunica talaris or a tunica intima beneath it, a long sleeve tunic. We can sort of see this silhouette and this layered idea coming into play in Planet of the Apes, but wait, it gets better. Let's take this Byzantine illustration and let's take a guerrilla general. See that heavy collar that falls over the shoulders, the superhumeral, very much an iconic part of Byzantine attire. Hello, superhumeral there. It's almost the same. The tablion, that piece of cloth or leather that was usually bejeweled or at least embroidered that hung at the breast. I think this was echoed here, the tablion. The little emblems that were sewn on sleeves and other parts of a Byzantine imperial garment, the segmentum. Hello, segmentum. It's starting to make sense now, isn't it? I'm not so crazy after all. And take a look at this the camelocum, which of course evolved into the bishop's mitre. And then look at the guerrilla general's headwear there. It's the same in spirit at least, but even more so, look at this Byzantine illustration of a soldier and look at the lapets that fall from his helmet. And they're completely echoed on the right here in Morton Huck's headdress for the guerrilla soldier. Come on, all of this is coming together. Please tell me I'm not crazy. This is Byzantine stuff, right? And I haven't even had any grape juice plus today. I'm going to hammer this home. Take a look at the costumes in Planet of the Apes and let's look at Byzantium costume. It doesn't take all that much to change things up. Look at the superhumerals. Look at the segmentums. Look at everything and then we can see it takes very little to turn the Byzantine costume into Planet of the Apes costume. In the same way we can take Morton Hark's Planet of the Apes costumes and with just a little bit of tweaking and colour here and there, we can make these simians Justinian and Theodora, right? But I would argue that Morton Hark drew on other aspects of Dark Age attire in his inspiration for Planet of the Apes. The mutants in Beneath the Planet of the Apes 
Look at the way they are dressed. Really the same to Dark Age or medieval monks, isn't it? It's kind of monastic kit. And take a look at this headwear. Basically, it's a medieval coif. I have to talk about the footwear in Planet of the Apes simply because I want you to know people didn't have footwear like this in the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, the Byzantine Empire. Who ever thought that this would become a thing? But yes, it actually became a thing. But come on, we all know what the best wardrobe in all of the original Planet of the Apes franchise movies was, don't we? From beneath the Planet of the Apes, Zira's blood red velvet hooded cape that she throws open to reveal a scaparelli pink silk lining and this wonderful velvet skirt suit, almost as good as Cornelius's carnaby striped dressing gown. I love these movies. Well, I'm sure that some of you want to damn me all to hell for that episode, but you can contact me to tell me so through my website, amandahallate.com. Join our Facebook group. We always have loads of fun over there. Check out our books at our publishing company, Dean Street Press. I will be back very soon with new episodes and maybe some more new and exciting theories. So just click that little circle to subscribe. And as always, thanks for watching. Bye for now.